I'm Megan Schnetzer, and I'm a certified trauma-informed coach. In this episode, we talk about why traditional talk therapy doesn't always work and what the true key to processing trauma and healing is. You're listening to The On-Call Empath. All right, we are back for another episode of The On-Call Empath. This is the Elite Coaches Series, and this episode, my next guest, Megan Schutzner is a trauma specialist, certified trauma-informed coach. And today we're going to tackle the uh, subjects of polyvagal theory. Uh, we're also going to be talking about difference between coaching and uh, therapy um, and why sometimes the traditional breathwork meditation and just the things that people expect us to do as trauma victims uh, sometimes don't work. I mean, what do you do when you get to that point where you've tried everything, you're on your last leg, and you're just so frustrated? If you're listening to this episode, I want anyone that's out there, if you're going through any type of stress, any type of uh, past trauma that you're dealing with, this is an episode you definitely want to tune into because I know I personally got a lot out of it. Um, again, this is not medical advice whatsoever. This is just me having a conversation with somebody who is very knowledgeable and, and trauma informed and very good at what they do. And that's why she is on the elite series. With that said, stay tuned and let's go ahead and get started. All right, guys, this is an episode I personally been waiting for for a long time. And if you guys have any questions on polyvagal theory, trauma response, healing, this is an episode you guys don't want to miss. I have a great honor to introduce Megan uh, Sh Shetzner. I hope I didn't butcher that last name, but uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I know you're a trauma-informed coach and a trauma survivor yourself. It's an honor to have you. How are you doing today? I am. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I love your Instagram and the work that you're doing. It just really, it hit me personally because I've had so many trauma specialists on this podcast and mm -hmm. the work that you're doing, I think the world needs to know and hear about, but let's dive right into it. When um, did you realize that, you know, traditional talk therapy was not working for you? And before that, can you just kind of tell us about your experience for the audience? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that everybody has some form of trauma, whether they recognize it or not in their background. And so mm -hmm. all of us operate from these internal beliefs, um, that are subconscious, you know, we don't know that we're operating from them, but I of course have those from my childhood and from growing up as we all do, but I did experience an acute trauma back in 2018 that really kind of changed the course of my life. It was one of those defining moments. Like there yeah. was a before and there was an after. And when my family and my friends found out that I had experienced this, they, they pushed me essentially into talk therapy and they did it with love. It was very, mm -hmm. you know, well-intentioned. Um, but it was kind of just crossing off the boxes. You know, I went through a traumatic experience. Oh, get her in therapy. Check. Yes. You know, get her talking to someone <laughs> check. And so, um, I quite frankly, started going to talk therapy when I was not ready for it myself. And there was a lot of recall in these sessions, like there is with a lot of traditional talk therapy and just rehashing my acute trauma over and over and over again. And I started to feel like I was just hitting a wall. Like I wasn't getting anywhere. There was no forward momentum. I wasn't moving the needle and I think when it really hit for me that it wasn't working was I would actually go to my therapy sessions and then I would leave therapy and walk across the street and go to the local bar and drink um, and drink until I couldn't remember anything anymore. And so this all makes sense once I learned the science, you know, the science behind it all. Um, but that's really the the moment that I realized this is not working and I have to explore other, other avenues for healing. Yeah, it must have been tough um, to go through all that. And I know a lot of you empaths that are listening also um, that are struggling right now is, you know, kind of given up, you know, they've tried the talk therapy portion. Mm -hmm. It could get to get you so far now, not to say, you know, it may not work for some people, like everyone's different. Um, so 
I just want to give a quick uh, disclaimer before we go on is like and everything that we discuss in this podcast is uh, definitely not medical advice. If you're going through any mental health issues, please um, reach out to your medical professional. This is just a um, conversation between both of us. So why why do you think like positive thinking, breath work, meditation, you know, it doesn't work for a lot of people because I've had people on here that are like, oh, I swear by this or I swear by that. And for some people, look, I've tried everything. I don't want to mm -hmm. I don't want to like go through that again. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those types, you know, to those people that have tried the traditional uh, things? Yeah, it's a great question. And you know, I'll kind of answer why traditional talk therapy doesn't always work in addition yeah. to why these things don't work because it was a huge piece of the puzzle that was missing for me. And again, I, I am also a firm believer in therapy. I think that it's a great thing, but I'm, I feel like it's one slice of the pie. You know, we need both what we call bottom up and top down modalities. And in my, at least in my experience, that's what I needed in order to process trauma. But, you know, when we are to getting a little science into the neuroscience and psychoeducation behind it all, but, um, our brain you know, we operate from many different parts of our brain and our prefrontal cortex is the part that's responsible for logic and reasoning and rationale and those conscious thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then we have our amygdala, which is in our limbic system, which is responsible for those fight, flight, or freeze responses. And so the issue is, is that both of them are operating systems and you can't have two operating systems online at the same time. And so when we are in talk therapy and we're recalling traumatic events, what happens is, you know, your, your nervous system is like, oh my goodness, this is triggering to me. And then your prefrontal cortex, part of your brain shuts off and your fight, flight, or freeze and your amygdala, you know, it starts taking over and it ends up keeping us traumatized or triggered, um, which is why I was hitting a wall and was not propelling forward. And it's why I would leave there in a state of fight or flight and go right to the bar and drink yeah. because that, you know, that was the coping mechanism I had that kind of shut it all off. And so sure. thinking, you know, positive thinking, breath work, meditation, et cetera, it's some of it is that, and some of it is that for a lot of people, there is a mismatch or misalignment between the nervous system state that they are actively in and the regulating resources that they're using. And so we would call things like that regulating resources, but for instance, you know, we have a very, what we call a high energy nervous system state, which is in the sympathetic and that's that fight or flight, right? You have all of this high sympathetic energy in your body. Yeah. Um, and so the issue is for somebody walking around with high anxiety, if they're to sit there and try and deep breathe through it or meditate <laughs> through it, it's not going to work because essentially they are suppressing the sympathetic energy instead of discharging it. And that energy has to move through the body in order to, for you to get to back to a state of equilibrium or sure. regulation. And so people are, they're mismatching. So if you're down in what we call dorsal, which is that low energy dissociated, super low energy state, something like breath work or meditation might work, but not if you're the average, you know, person going around with high levels of anxiety. And so the resource we use has to match the state that we're in, in order for us to come back to a state of regulation which is why we do so much psychoeducation in our programs, because what comes first is the awareness, the self-awareness mm -hmm. of what nervous system state am I in right now? Am I anxious? Yeah. Am I angry? Am I exhausted? You know, wh where am I? Yeah. That's very interesting. I get a lot of people that write in that, that tell me like, Hey, you know, I got a lot of good results from breath work or talk therapy or so and so forth. And then I have other people that have said that ev they've tried everything underneath the sun and nothing's worked. And mm -hmm. it gets very frustrating when you get to that end of the line. And if, you, if anyone's listening to this right now and you feel like you've tried everything and nothing's worked and it, like you get to that really affects your mental health because you give up, you give up mm -hmm. on life and you're just, especially now, like, especially post COVID, there's a lot of people still in trauma. And so that's my next question to you. Do you believe everyone has trauma or, or trauma responses? Yeah, I, I absolutely do think that people have experienced some form of trauma. Um, some of us don't recognize it because living in trauma or chaos was our normal. Um, and so 
we might not even be aware of it. <laughs> um, some of us don't recognize it because, you know, trauma is really, it's less about what happened to you in the past and is more about how it's recreating itself in the present. And so if you were someone too, who experienced trauma, but had a very supportive environment at the time that you experienced trauma, it may have been more like tolerable stress than, you know, a toxic kind of stress. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no such thing as I hate when people compare trauma or saying yes. like, you know, my trauma is too insignificant. <laughs> yes. Trauma is relative and yeah. everyone reacts differently. And it's funny because I get so many clients yeah. who they associate their personality traits as part of them, but really they're not personality traits, they're trauma responses when we yeah. dig a little <laughs> further. Like and I'm what I'm totally one that did it for the longest time. But, you know, I have clients that say I'm just type A. I'm like, are you type A or did you learn that you needed to overperform, overachieve and achieve perfection in, in order for anybody to actually yeah. love you? Or, you know, I've had somebody say I'm all the I'm introverted, right? Are you introverted or did you realize that in order to shield yourself from getting hurt, you had to self isolate? and keep people yeah. out. And so that's what you do. You're not, you're not, you know, in a fight response because you're Italian and you walk around and you're just this angry Italian. No, you're, you're probably lashing out because mm -hmm. you live in a state of fight. And so it's these procedural patterns that we have that we wear like armor. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, they're just the self-protective behaviors that have protected us mm -hmm. so long that we take them on as part of our identity. Yeah. And I would imagine like a lot of our environment that we're in uh, causes this, whether you're in a narcissistic uh, relationship or mm -hmm. in a work environment that has a toxic boss, or let's say you're just, as, I, there's a lot of people that listen in, you know, that they're just kind of taking care of their own kids. That's a stressful job in itself. And they have all these things going on and then slowly, but surely you know, after a certain time, you're repressing your emotions, and then it gets out of hand. And then the anxiety, mm -hmm. the depression come, you know, rears his head out. Um, if we take somebody out of a very traumatic situation and put them in a peaceful, mm -hmm. calm uh, place, can that be a severe trigger? Can they be like, okay, th this is too much, because they're I'm not used to this quietness, loneliness, and maybe there's some trauma bond sprinkled in there and they start to freak out because I've had people tell me that too, or I can't live without this certain person or this chaos. And then the, it's like a heroin drug and they need that person to put them down or that toxic person to say something to them. Have you ever heard that? Like where if we just take someone out of their toxic environment, put them in a, you know, normal situation. And then we think that that would solve the problem, but it doesn't, it could make things kind of worse. Oh, hundred percent. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's hard because we say you can't, you can't heal in an environment that's keeping you sick, which is true. However, same is safe to our nervous systems. And so if your nervous system is one that is used to surviving in chaos, yeah, putting yourself in a situation where there is no chaos is going to feel, it's not going to feel safe. It's going to feel scary and yeah. threatening. Um, and that's what happens to, you know, with relationships, if you've been in abusive relationship after abusive relationship, yeah. and then you land with someone who actually treats you right. Not only does it feel unsafe, a lot of times it feels boring, Yeah. right? You're like, this is boring. <laughs> that's crazy. That's why we keep going back to these types of people to feel normal, you know, yeah. self-protective. Absolutely. People call them self-sabotaging behaviors. I always just call them self-protective. I've always wondered that. And I get so many questions They're like, Hey, how come I keep going back and getting these ba into bad relationships or I keep getting even jobs. Like I keep going to these high pressure jobs and I have this boss and yeah. it's just the same type of people. And that's what we're looking for in our minds because that's what we're used to. And it makes so much sense. That's those procedural patterns. And, you know, one other point on that is a lot of times I think we try to do too much at one time. Our nervous system is overwhelmed extremely easily. And you know, that armor that I talked about earlier, you it's, we don't want to just send you, you know, after battle, you come back, 
near because you know we suit up to go to battle we have to when we're fighting things in life it's important to have those fight flight or freeze responses you put your armor on but in an ideal world when the threat is over you can remove it but not trauma survivors but instead of just stripping you of all your armor at the same time you have to do it in a we call it titrated you have to do it in a titrated way Mm -hmm. it has to be slow we say we have to stretch your nervous system without stressing your nervous system. So yeah. it's just removing it one piece at a time. That's how we work it in our programs anyway. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so I just kind of want to switch gears here a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people are probably wondering out there because um, they've tried the therapy route and mm-hmm. some of them go to coaches, yep. go back and forth, flip back and forth. What is the biggest difference in your opinion between talk therapy and coaching? Would you say? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a question that I had when I found coaching (laughs) because I needed it to be different than therapy. Um, And it it was, it was life-changing for me. And obviously I've watched it with my clients, but there are a few, there are a few big differences. Um, We are not recall therapy is one. Um, We don't work in the past because we believe it's counterintuitive. Uh, You know, your past, it happened it's over with. We can't go back and change it as much as I'm sure many of us would, would love to. Yeah. So it's important to acknowledge the past and honor our past and recognize, you know, that it, it plays a part in, in where we are today, but the problem isn't in the past. The past is done and over. The problem is how the trauma is being recreated in the present. And so we are very present focused, um, because that is what is in our circle of control. Mm -hmm. Um, we use a lot of bottom-up modalities, meaning, you know, whereas traditional talk therapy is what we call top-down. So it starts with the brain and cognition, and then it's kind of that change your thoughts, change your actions type mm-hmm. mantra. Um, we're the opposite. And so research has shown that when you go through a traumatic experience, the part of your brain that houses your hippocampus, which is where we store our memories, gets shut down. And so traumatic memory doesn't get stored in our brain. Traumatic memory is actually stored as implicit memory in our body, Mm -hmm. um, which is why triggers come back as sensory memories, not explicit memories. They're things you feel. Um, And so in order to address the trauma and process the trauma, we have to go to where the trauma is stored, which is in the body. So we do a lot of somatic experiencing. Somatic just means in the body. Um, And then we also do, you know, the key to healing is nervous system regulation. Um, But a lot of us don't have the psychoeducation to know that. And so nervous system regulation and not just like, not the kind of thing we were talking about earlier, like, oh, just chant some phrases or do some deep breathing. It's not throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. It's like we customize nervous system maps for you You literally leave our program with your talk full of resources of practical, tangible tools that when I'm anxious, I do this and it regulates me. Or when I'm angry, I do this and it regulates me. Mm -hmm. So therapy was great. But I remember thinking in the the week in between that I saw her, I was like, what am I supposed to do with myself? Like, I just hold all this in my head until I talk to her again, you know, on Tuesday. (laughs) Um, This is very much, you know, we believe that you're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You have everything you need inside of you. You are resourced, but we're helping you unlock that. And here it is. And you have the power to do it. Wow. So all you guys that are listening out there, I hope you're getting a lot. I am certainly, um, let's talk about polyvagal trained and Mm -hmm. what that is and polyvagal theory first, if you can kind of define that and why that specialty is is so much different from just going to somebody that's just trained as just a trauma th- therapist or something like that. Yeah, sure. So um, polyvagal training is really, it all comes back to the nervous system. And basically polyvagal training just means that the coaches in our practice work within the parameters of polyvagal theory. And so The polyvagal nervous system model is the most recent nervous system model um, that's been put out and it originated with Dr. Stephen Porges. If you Mm -hmm. ever have free time, go look him up. Um, But we used to basically believe that our nervous system had two states. There was um, fight or flight. And then we had 
like a rest and digest phase. So it was almost viewed as like a seesaw, if you can picture that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we now know more about how our nervous system functions and it actually works more like a ladder. And so we have, um, the top of the ladder, which is, it's called ventral. It's like our state, our safe and connected state, which is where we want to find ourselves in most of the time. And then when you move down the ladder in the middle, you have your sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, which is that high energy state. And then at the bottom, you have what we call dorsal, which is our, um, it's more of like a disconnected, low energy, dissociated, shut down or freeze state. And so um, there's actually three parts. And what we've learned is that you move up and down the ladder, you know, hundreds of times a day, naturally, and you can't skip steps just like a regular ladder. You can't skip steps. Yeah. And so um, it's really just the understanding of how our nervous system works, how we were designed to pendulate between the nervous system states and understanding that that's not a bad thing. Our nervous system was designed to protect us, not harm us. And so right. it's good to be able to do that. There's no bad state. The problem lies when we get stuck, right? Like when we can't move ourselves out of these chronic states of survival. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it just really comes with a, a very deep understanding of the nervous system and, and how it works. Yeah. It just seems like no matter what you do nowadays, like everyone has some sort of trauma that they're carrying from the past or even nowadays sure. with so much that's going on on the news and um, the stuff that we put in our bodies, like just everything, it seems like it would be some sort of trigger to the average person. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, you have to be kind of like in a, in a state where you have to know like what you're putting in your body and taking time for those walks and, and mm -hmm. putting yourself first and knowing when to say no and having boundaries and all of that. It just, it's, it's work. I mean, it, I mean, what do you think? Like for the average person that's listening right now may not be like in a severe trauma, but like they're stressed out, like everyday yeah. work, maybe the single parent trying to manage mm -hmm. kids and then, you know, uh, keep a job and, and inflation like that is causing our nervous system to mm -hmm. be stressed out 24 seven. Oh, absolutely. Chronic stress falls in the same bucket as, mm -hmm. as trauma. And we are, we are a bunch of <laughs> dysregulated people walking around <laughs> trying to, <laughs> trying to make it through life. And I say me, that, yeah, oh, 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 it's me too. <laughs> and you know, way worse before, you know, <laughs> doing what I did with the work, but you know, I'm a mom and I am a teacher. I, I work in the education field in addition to this. And the issue is that when we don't take the time to learn how to regulate ourselves, then that dysregulation bleeds over um, to our children, to our students, to our friends and our family and, you know, the other people in our lives that matter. And that's why as much as trauma is not your fault, of course not, never, but healing is your responsibility. Yeah. I've heard that. Very powerful, guys. I hope you guys are getting chills like me because that is so true. And even generational trauma, I know for me, my personal life, if, would you, I mean, even if your great grandparents were like in a war mm -hmm. time setting, that could actually trickle down to your generations where. Yep people could be hyper vigilant and uh, or have high anxiety or have those symptoms i mean isn't that's crazy how it would be genetically passed down through you know epigenetics and all that stuff is a whole can of worms but like do you believe that trauma can be passed down even in the womb i know uh, uh gabor mate is very big on that mm. subject as well yeah i love him by the way oh my gosh he's great he's a pioneer <laughs> in everything trauma um I do. And I actually, I believe that trauma is passed down from generation to generation in two ways. It's not only genetic where it physically can alter your DNA, but I think that it also is, you know, it's passed down behaviorally. If you, that's why you see addiction run in families, you know, your trauma responses are passed down. If that's what you grow up with as, Oh, that's the, that's the way that I cope with this. Why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it, it's strong. It's strong yeah. in families for sure. And it takes a very courageous person to decide that it stops with me. 
Yeah. So any of you guys that feel like trapped or you just going in this hamster wheel, there is hope, you know, definitely I've, I've learned a lot from just this episode. So just kind of wrapping up here. Um, can you just explain to the audience what kind of topics that you cover in your programs? Cause I think that's very important that they should know this. Yeah. Yeah. So we do, um, we do a lot of psychoeducation, um, which is teaching our clients about the brain, about the nervous system, the body, and about trauma and the ways that humans respond to trauma, because it's important to understand from a biological standpoint, why we are the way we are. And with that typically comes a lot of understanding and comes a lot more self-compassion, right? Cause it's like, I make sense now. Yeah. Um, so once we do that, we do, we do a lot of the nervous system regulation, um, find what your regulating resources are. We map out your triggers and what we call your glimmers. They're your opposite of, of triggers. They're your, your safety things that bring you safety. Um, we we do core wounds work, which really gets to the original core wounds or traumas of where these internalized beliefs stemmed from, um, that you operate and there's layers there, you know, there's emotions, there's your thought processes, there's the behaviors, which is what everybody sees. Um, we do attachment work with attachment styles. We do a lot of inner child work and parts work also known as internal family systems for those listening that know that, um, a lot of somatic work working with the body. Um, and then we do a lot of integrative work just so taking all of this and then how do I shift from surviving to thriving and take mm -hmm. everything that I know and actually integrate it into my life. Yes. And that's a lot of the stuff that you just went through. Um, I, I mean, again, these are specialized, so it's like not every person is going to kind of be uh, trained in that area. So I mm. think that's what makes you uh, so interesting that you have all these tools in your toolbox and I'll have everything in, in the link in the bio guys, uh, definitely check her out. But before we leave, I want to give you the last word here. Um, yeah for all those people that are listening, what would you tell the listeners or you want them to know about their experience with trauma, trauma responses and healing? I think it's very important coming from somebody that's not only been through it, but very good at what you do. I think it will leave it yeah. at that at, before we take off. Yeah. Thank you. Um, gosh, there's so much, but I think if I had to narrow it down, I would tell everybody what I, some of the most important things I tell my clients, um, which is you know, thank yourself for being who you needed to be to survive. Um, I know a lot of these trauma responses come with maybe some regret, some shame, some things that we aren't proud of, but at the end of the day, you did what you had to do to be sitting here right now because you don't, you don't know where any other path would lead and you're here. And so I think it's important to know that and to know that you were just protecting yourself. Um, appreciate the time that you needed to be who you became. I have so many clients that are like, I'm so frustrated that I didn't start this work earlier, or yeah. I feel like I've wasted so much time. But the reality is it happens when the timing is right. And maybe, maybe you weren't ready years ago. Maybe your environment wasn't supportive yeah. years ago. Um, and so it happens when it's supposed to, I would say to forgive yourself for not having been who you truly are. Um, because when we're in that mode of self-protection, oftentimes we aren't acting in alignment with our beliefs and our values. And we aren't doing things that are authentic to us and to who we really are. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just knowing too, that you never truly start at square one with healing. You, you yeah. never know less than you did when you started. I know that it's like three steps forward, 10 steps back. It feels like some days, <laughs> but you never go back all the way to square one. And it's never too late to start the journey. I mean, we have clients in their sixties and seventies in our program. It is never too late and you're worth it. I love that. I hope you guys took that and it's never too late. It's always, there's always hope no matter what age and what you've been through. There's always hope. So Megan, thank you so much for being a guest. You're always welcome back and keep up the amazing work. You're, you're just amazing at what you do. And, and I would love to have you back in the future. Thank you so much. I'd love to come back. All right. All right, guys, that does it for this episode. 
Uh, stay tuned for the next episode. We got a lot more guests coming on. If you can like, subscribe to this channel, and please share this with anyone that might be going through a really tough time. I think that if anyone could get this message out there that there is hope out there, I think they'll like make someone's day. And, and especially nowadays with so much going on in the world, um, we all have to kind of stick together. And that's why I do this podcast is to share the knowledge with everyone. So if you're, you're not alone, always keep moving forward. So with that said, we are out. Oh.